Well, hi there. Thanks for finding the Profitable Photographer with Lucy Dumas here on YouTube. If you want more, you can just go to any podcast channel and find the show or go to lucydumascoaching.com, Lucy with an I, to learn more about me and to listen to shows. And thank you for subscribing, sharing with your friends, and I hope you enjoy. Bye for now. Hello. Hola. Bonjour. Howdy. <laughs> this is Lucy, and we are going to jump into part two of Jeffrey Shaw's interview. Last week, we posted the first part, and I enjoyed it so much, and there was so much richness that I decided you would benefit by having it split in two. I wouldn't want you to be listening to the first half and then in your car, arrive at your destination and not jump in and listen to that second part. So here we go on that. Before we start, I want to remind you that I'm starting a group coaching program soon and September 2019. So if you go to lucydumascoaching.com and click on the tab that says classes, you can learn more, you can register there, or you can also get on my calendar to have a quick chat if you need more info. And also, if you haven't downloaded my ebook, 10 Big Ideas for Marketing High End Photography, you will see a place to register for that as well. So here we go with Jeffrey, and we'll be talking about the second part of his book, Lingo, which if you haven't gotten it, get it. And if you haven't read it, especially the last three chapters or so, honestly, it's one of the best books I've read in a long time about being successful in photography. So once again, welcome, Jeffrey. So I have couple of questions and there are uh, some things when I was reading the last few chapters of your book, which for me, you know, sometimes I don't know if you're guilty of this, but get a book and the first half you get so much out of it. And then another book comes along and I was committed to finishing it. And I'm glad I did because I love the last few chapters. So the one about, the six practices and first of all creating affirmations for me that is a super important part of being successful and happy in life so i wonder if you currently have a favorite affirmation i do and to talk about the power of affirmations a little bit, let me give you some context as to how that part of the book came about kind of what i refer to as the self-help part of the book Jeffrey, that's probably why I like that part. And it's interesting for a business book because, you know, if I had my druthers, that would have been first, right? Because ultimately, I believe that we have to change ourselves on the inside before we can apply strategies. Mm -hmm. And I think when we don't do that is the very reason why people get stuck on the proverbial hamster wheel. Because we're constantly given the latest thing, the latest tool, the latest workshop, and we keep applying and applying it, but we wonder, we wonder why we're working really hard, but hardly getting ahead. And the reason for that is, is that you're changing the exterior without really changing the interior. And so if we're up to me, I would have put those chapters first. And in fact, those chapters are actually a result of a book I wrote the year before, which never got published. I had originally written what would one would consider a self-help book. My overall career plan was to write a book about how to change people's entrepreneurs' mindsets and then provide a book that gave strategy. But here's why I reversed the order. And I reversed the order because fundamentally, and this is an important business lesson, in the book I refer to it as the acknowledged need and deeper need. We all have an acknowledge what we think we need, but then experts see in us what we really need. You have to address people's acknowledged need first, because if you give somebody, even if, even if as an expert in your field, if you know it's what they need, but if they're not ready to receive it, it doesn't serve them. So a simple comparison I'll make for photographers is 
how often you know people might reach out to you and say, how much is an eight by 10? And so many photographers are turned off by that question or turned off by, if it seems a low in question, first of all, they're just starting with an acknowledged need. Like they know they need a photograph. They may not know what they ultimately need. They may not know that their deeper need is to, as I always said, the deeper need of my clients was to be stopped as they walk down the hallway and mm. reflect on that moment with their family, right? They never asked for that. No one's going to call and say, oh, I'd like to hire you as a photographer because I'd like your photographs to stop me in my hallway so I can reflect on a special moment in my family's life. They're not going to ask for that. They're going to ask for the photograph. And it may just be an eight by 10 because that's the only size they can think of at the moment. So the real power is understanding people's deeper needs. So I know everyone's deeper need is to create the practices in their lives that make the strategies we apply in business work. Otherwise, we just keep working really hard, but hardly getting ahead. But I had to reverse the order. I had to give people what they asked for, which were strategies. So I wrote Lingo in a format that first gave people effective marketing and branding strategies that I know work. But then I finished the book by saying, okay, now that I've given you that, here is some ways of changing your being and your mindset and your, your daily practices that if you apply those, it will make the strategies I gave you actually work. So for example, I, I have to point out one of the practices, my favorite practice I demonstrate in the book is uh, what I call a what's going right journal. Oh yes, I love that. This I can tell you scientifically works. <laughs> it works because it creates, it first of all works based on science, cognitive bias it's called. All right, cognitive bias is that you are biased, more inclined to see what you've put into your brain. Now this is just human nature. Our brains are innately wired for negativity because of survival, which is why you can hear nine compliments, one insult, and we will only remember the insult. We focus on the insult even though we got nine compliments, because it's a threat to our ego. It's a threat to how we feel about ourselves. And our brains are wired for survival. So how do you reverse that? How do you reverse it so that you don't see the negativity in the world? For me, it's the what's going right journal, where every morning you journal, not what you're grateful for, because there's a fine line here, but what's literally going right in your life. Like, oh, I'm meeting really awesome people who are connecting me to other people. What's going right in my life is that I am more open to growing than I used to be. What's going right in my life is that I'm meeting influential people. What's going right in my life is I'm being braver than I used to be. What this does as a, a practice of retraining the brain is that because of cognitive bias, the more you start journaling about what's going right in your life, guess what the result is? You start seeing more of what's going right. Yes. It is such a literal tool to turn your mindset around so that you can see more things going right in your business. Right. I, I know before we actually started recording, I mentioned that I had had brain surgery a few years ago. And one of the things that my sister noticed, it was a four-year journey. It was benign tumor, but it was still a lot. <laughs> and my sister noticed that whenever I was afraid or in pain, I would start listing everything I was grateful for. I have a great doctor. I have the money for this. Right now I feel good. And I realized that that habit of what's going right and gratitude in my whole life, because I've been on a spiritual path as you have in life, that it became so useful in, a, in an area and a moment in my life that I never would have imagined. And it, it got me through it with the ability to sleep at night and have peace because I would notice what was working. So thank you for connecting the dots <laughs> yep. on that as well. So one of the first parts of the six practices that I'm totally in agreement with is believing that there are forces working on our behalf and with my coaching clients, we spend some time setting some really big, yummy goals. And they're always like, well, I don't know what to think about. And I say, you know, there's a, there's a chef just waiting for your order. And, and this chef will create whatever you desire. But the more clear you are, the more you'll love the meal. And so 
Can you share your thoughts on believing that there are forces working on our behalf? And you know what? And that's honestly, Lucy, with great transparency, I'll say this is, it's been really hard for me. This has been a really hard concept for me because I am innately so, and I think it's true of a lot of entrepreneurs, I am innately so independent. You know, I I joke around that I think my parents forgot I lived at home from the age of 14 on. I was the youngest of three boys. And, but what that did for, it just, it made me, I am incredibly independent. And so many people, even those of great faith will say, oh no, no, I believe there are forces working on my behalf. I believe there's a God or whatever you want to refer to as working on my behalf. But then I'll say, really, then why do you also act like the weight of the world is on your shoulders? Why is it that you feel if you don't do it, it's not? I mean, so many photographers are pretty controlling. I'm like, really? Well, if you believe that, then why do you also believe that if no one can do it as well as you can do it? If you believe that, then why is it that if if in order for it to be perfect, you have to do it? Right. So there's a conflict of emotions that I think you have to to reason. And I'm not saying that you can surrender (laughs) completely, but there's a balance to be had there. And it has been one of the most difficult challenges for me. And I studied Buddhism for many years and was on a great quest to find a Buddha that I could put on my little altar that I have in my bedroom, which I meditate in front of. But there's a particular hand gesture in Buddhism, which is referred to as effort and surrender. And it's the effort is one hand, uh, your hand is upright, representing the flame of effort. And the other one is your other hand is sort of a, in a horizontal, almost a scooping position, like a receiving palm up position. And that's surrender. And that to me is the ultimate balance is how do we live our lives with effort and surrender? And it's really hard to do. So for me, and I think for a lot of us as, you know, hardworking entrepreneurs, it's been really hard to trust our forces working on my behalf because it's so hard for me to let go and, and trust in forces or a net that's going to catch me. Right. I want to share a quick something that illustrates that for me, but I'd love to hear if you have an example. I lost a pair of sunglasses on a vacation and I'm hard to fit and I'm vain. So they need to be cute. And I was in the middle of nowhere. I was uh, Mount hood. And I just said, those perfect glasses are going to show up and I let it go. And as I was driving up this windy road, right next to a little pullout was a pair of glasses in the middle of the road. And of course they fit me perfectly and were super cute. Yeah. So if if whatever that force is can get me a pair of sunglasses. <laughs> so do you have an example you can think of? Oh gosh, so many because it's just the way I live my life now, right? I just um it's an interesting dynamic because it is letting go and trusting. And it just happens to me so often. If I try to force something, and it ties into another chapter of my book, which I call Reciprocal Communication. Ooh, I love that one too. Which Reciprocal Communication is about paying attention to what wants you as much as you want it, right? Because so often we are pursuing what we want, whether it's the career goal or the next level in our business or even a relationship, right? We're so busy pursuing what we want, we don't pause long enough to pay attention to whether what we want wants us in return or if that's the time in which it wants. And I've been very open, in fact, that it took me 13 applications before I got my TEDx event. And in in hindsight, looking back, I'm so grateful it didn't happen any of the previous 12 times because I wasn't ready for it in the way that I would have wanted to be ready. So the universe, those forces took care of me in that they didn't give me what I wanted when I thought I wanted it. But when it came along, it couldn't have been more perfect. Not only was it the perfect TEDx event for me, it was in Manhattan, which is my, you know, where I had moved from four years ago. And all three of my kids were able to attend without even getting on an airplane, you know, not not to mention friends. And so it's just that innate sense of trust that it's not a lot up to you. Now, I will tell you, I've gone so far with the power of believing that there are forces working on our behalf. I actually went as far now as I created what I call a forces list. And those are individuals. I have a forces list. I call it my forces list. It's a list of about 12 people that just show up in my life like a wind underneath my wings, like classic phrase. Like they just show up in my life as people that refer me for speaking engagements. They show up in my life saying, hey, just try to check me to see how you're doing just when I needed somebody to. And there are just this, this, 
this forces of people. So it was happening so frequently that I had these certain individuals in my life that showed up in really powerful ways that I, I wrote it out as a forces list so that I could honor them and also make sure that I was paying back and that I was showing up in their life and maybe in the way that they, they wanted to. That's how powerful the whole idea of just trusting that there are forces working on your behalf is also noticing that there are people literally working on our behalf to see to it that we get what we want at our lives. And yeah, so I think it's, like I said, it's been one of my biggest challenges because I am so innately independent. If I don't take care of it, it's not going to get done. If I want it, I'm going to go for it. And I just like, you know, get out of my way. This is all up to me. The weight of the world is on my shoulders. It's sort of, it's interesting how it ties into the quote you started with. This quote from my father, which when I was a little kid, and my father was a very quiet man, didn't say much, but the one thing, and he, he died when I was pretty young, but this one thing that stuck with me was that no one cares about your life as much as you do. Now, I actually think in a lot of ways that ingrained this independence in me that, you know, and it wouldn't honestly, for who my father was as a character, it would have been advice that he would have given just like, well, nobody's got to take, you got to take care of your own life. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Um, <laughs> He didn't know he was like saying like, ah, the word from on high. Well, I, I actually, if, you know, again, to be honest with you, I mean, I, I see it. I turned it into a positive. I don't think he meant it particularly right. positive. Right. I think he right. reinforced the idea that you're on your own, buddy. Like no one's going to give a crap about you or your life. And I turned it into a positive as I share it with other people as well and wanted to share it with, with your listeners is the sense of responsibility that no one's going to take care of your life. No one cares about your life as much as you do. And that actually became really important to me as an employer. When I had employees, realizing that, you know, they were doing the best they can, but not to hold them to a standard of commitment to the business that I held. Because of course, obviously I cared about this business more than they did. So I think that's the foundation of why I felt so independent. Like it's all on my shoulders. No one else did. But I've had to learn to balance that, which is ultimately what we're always striving for. I've had to learn to balance that with also knowing that there are forces working on my behalf and that if the answer really lies in the balance of the two, that yes, I do live my life as if no one's going to care about it as much as I do. And if, if I don't make my life what I want it to be, then no one else is going to do it. But at the same time, I can't get there alone, that it requires individuals and forces beyond my understanding. Yes, we're, we're not alone. There's a book that I can't remember the title of, and the whole story is a woman who thinks that the world's out to get her and nobody helps her, and at the end, she's in her house, and people are literally doing her yard work, painting, repairing while she's sitting there thinking, I'm alone, I'm alone, I'm alone. And, and then she realizes it. And something really touched me in that because I had carried that. It's that balance. Nobody cares as much about my life as I do. And yet it's a benevolent world with all kinds of forces working on our behalf. And she starts to laugh. And when I put that book down, I laughed with tears in my eyes as well. Because the, the realization that we need to take care of ourselves, but also we are not alone in this journey is a paradox that is so true. Mm -hmm. I think maybe, you know, Lucy, talking it through with you, I think what it is is that we do, we need to accept that at first, no one cares about our life as much as we do. But how you get these forces to work on your behalf is to share the life you want. Yes. It's to let the universe know the life you want, the life that you want to build. So it takes a knowing, it takes a commitment to realizing that no one cares about your life as much as you do. It's up to you to create the life you want. But once you are clear on the life you want, you then have to be vulnerable enough to share it. You have to let the universe know so that those forces, can, the universal forces can work on your behalf. You have to let people around you know the life that you want to create because you will be shocked at how people will show up to say, I'll help you get there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that I think is achieves the, the balance that we're both speaking of. And I'm sure in your coaching, you help people formulate what it is they want that they haven't been able to articulate or think about. 
And I'm sure, as I have, you've seen people just have massive change and all kinds of quote unquote miracles happen simply from getting that clarity with your coaching. Would you? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned that I spoke at Imaging this past year, which I did. It was my talk about lingo and I laid out the strategies in a way, again, this ties into what we were saying earlier. I gave the audience of photographers at Imaging what I felt that they would most benefit from at that time, which was strategy. Let me help you help yourself in your business. Let me give you some strategies to make your business irresistible by learning to speak the lingo of your customers. Well, next year, this coming January, I'll be speaking at Imaging again. And the talk I'm giving is called Life is an Everything Bagel. Mm. And it is a much more inspirational talk. I'm so excited about this. I hope everyone will, will come because I'm really excited about this presentation of Life is an Everything Bagel, where now that I've given you the strategies, now I want to help photographers. Uh, and this will be a talk I, I hope to give a larger scale to other audiences as well, but I'm, I'm kicking it off at imaging. So this would be a brand new talk. And the reason I refer to as life is an everything bagel is because I, I just became fascinated by the whole notion of everything bagels. <laughs> In fact, didn't like them for years. I didn't like them. And I realized I didn't like everything bagels because I was afraid of the idea of having everything. And I became fascinated by the idea, like what was that like that morning in a bagel shop when somebody you know, because we had poppy seed bagels, we had uh, sesame seed bagels, we had onion bagels, onion. We had bagels. Who, what creative person thought, let's put, let's have everything. Why are we choosing? <laughs> yeah. And that became the fundamental, the basis of this talk was what would life look like if we stopped choosing between things? Because when we stop choosing between things, we actually start choosing everything. I love it. And I can't wait. Right. And I want to help people choose a life of everything. <laughs> like let's, let's not choose between, you know, business success and a personal life. Let's have everything. Let's have the, the lives of abundance that we yes. are uh, destined to have. So darling listener, it's time for you to sign up for Imaging Expo, which will be in Nashville this year so that you can attend Jeffrey's talk. I know I'm excited to hear it, Jeffrey. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm just beginning to craft the ideas. It'll be a brand new talk, but one that I, it's actually being kicked around as possibly the basis of my next book as well. So we'll see. Cool. 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 So what's your current favorite affirmation? So in affirmations, I want to clarify because it probably won't make sense. Affirmations should only make sense to you, right? And, and it, it may not make sense to anybody else. Um, the other thing I want to say about affirmations is the reason if affirmations don't work for you, haven't worked in the past, it's probably, well, there's a several reasons and I list a few in the book. Uh, either it wasn't actually something that was affirmative or you didn't stick with it long enough. And that I think is usually the biggest problem. So for me, my current affirmation is I am empowered to create my next 20 years. Mm. And I say that because again, it's sort of like reading somebody else's horoscope, right? It, it may not mean anything to anybody else, but it means something to me. It's because I'm at this point, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at my next 20 years and what do I want it to look like? Because I'm all about choosing everything. I'm all about life is at everything bagel. And I'm all about controlling my destiny and being, you know, as we said right in the beginning, like no one's going to care about my life as much as I do. I want it to look the way I want it to look for the next 20 years. But it comes for fear in a way that it hasn't in the past. Like when I was 20, 25, 30, I can't say I had a lot of fear about how I wanted life to look, not the way I feel it now. And I think it's just an age thing. I'm 55 now. And looking at the next 20 years comes with a little more fear than it used to. Like, I'm, I'm fearful of not having enough. I'm fearful of not making as much of an impact. I'm fearful of running out of time that maybe I don't make as big of a difference as I had hoped. But I'm at the same time, I'm fearful of what if my speaking career explodes at an even bigger level because I really like being at home. I don't want to travel too much. So it's opposing fears mm -hmm. <laughs> at the same time. So that affirmation is helping me just step into my core step into silence and be confident that I am empowered to create my next 20 years. And I need to recite that affirmation every morning to quiet down the fears so that I can feel empowered with the decisions I make as I lay out my next 20 years because I am transitioning from, you know, out of photography towards the work that I want to do. 
how much do I want to be on the road speaking? Uh, how much do I want to be home? How do I, how much do I want to make sure I'm available to my partner and to my children and things that are most important to me in my life and making sure I mold the next 20 years to look exactly as I want to. That's and it, good, like, it comes with more fear than it ever has before. So for me, yes. I have to quiet those fears down and just know that I am empowered. I've done it before. I've created the life that I've wanted up to this point. I'm empowered to do it again. And there are forces working on your behalf. Forces you. working on my behalf <laughs> and people. <laughs> yes. One that has helped me a lot, and it came from fear of being broke, is money comes to me easily and with love. Mm, exactly. And there was a time when, when I was wedding photographer where I was meeting perfect clients and they weren't booking. And it's because there was a mini recession. And so all the good photographers were available. And so I thought up this affirmation. And when people would come up the driveway, I'd be thinking money comes to me easily and with love and just over and over again, repeating that. And I booked four weddings in three days, Yeah, just directly from that. And I know it, it changed my energy. I know it made me focus on them and not my need. So yeah, they are super powerful. And another one I love is thank you for everything. I have no complaints whatsoever. Mm, and that has helped me when I'm in some difficult times in life where I would have a right to complain. So I'm not surprised that the second half of the book is one that I especially resonated with because Clearly, you and I are on the same page about the inner journey as well as the outer journey to success. Yeah, I actually think it's another idea I've been playing with is what I call the entrepreneur ecosystem. Mm. Uh, and because I think our needs as entrepreneurs is different than business owners or other. I just think, you know, entrepreneurship to me is, is an ecosystem. We can't just have the strategies. We also need the mindsets. We need the daily practices. Being a creative warrior, being an entrepreneur, those two terms are somewhat interchangeable to me because it just means that we are willing to put ourselves out on a limb. We, we put ourselves out there as entrepreneurs and as creative warriors with the peaceful sense of warriorship. We put ourselves out on a limb. We subject ourselves to, we subject our fragile souls, right? We, we tend to be people that are, intuitive and empathetic and we are willing to put our fragile souls on the line because we believe so deeply in how we can serve other people mm. and it's not just business strategies that's why i look at it as an entrepreneur ecosystem what are all the pieces that we need we need mindset we need practices we need a community we need yes the strategies we need better branding that connects with the customers that we our ideal customers we need all these pieces and i fear that we've become very fragmented and we wind up chasing not squirrels <laughs> but chasing different gurus in the world that everybody has an answer we hear such contradictory opinions that we have a hard time dropping into what's best for us. And I think only another entrepreneur can really understand that. Only another creative warrior can really relate to that. And I think that's kind of what's lacking. I mean, I, I think you're probably aware of this. Uh, kind of a perfect literal example of this is Apple Podcasts, formerly known as iTunes. When I started my podcast five years ago, there was no entrepreneurship catalog, uh, category. No, there was a business category and under, you know, because when we, when we post our podcast, we are for our show, we create, there's like, there are categories and then subcategories and creative warriors. I had to put it under business and the closest I could come to what the show is about was careers. There was no entrepreneurship. iTunes just now is recategorizing podcasts within Apple Podcasts, that there is finally, five years after I launched my show, there's finally a category called entrepreneurship. Interesting. It's crazy, but that's literally, and it's the same is true in Amazon and books, like it's really hard to categorize because the world is, that's this whole idea of life isn't everything bagel, is because we live in a black and white world. You're either, you know, you, you have a business life and a personal life. You, well, any entrepreneur will tell you that the, the line between our business lives and our personal lives is almost non-existent. 
Right. Right. Which is one of the things I love is to me, being an entrepreneur is the greatest personal growth workshop. Yeah. It's personal growth on steroids. Yeah. (laughs) And then when we grow, then our businesses are better. Yeah. And then we have to grow some more to grow into those better businesses, which, yeah, it's a beautiful, scary upward spiral. When you asked me about a favorite quote, uh, I resisted sharing actually my very favorite quote, which I'm now going to share with you because I say it all the time. I recite this quote all the time. I'm like, I want to give Lucy's audience something different because I feel like, you know, I say the same thing all the time. But, but, you know, your favorite quote is your favorite quote. And it's been the basis of so much of my life. And it's by Jim Rohn. And the quote is, your level of success rarely exceeds your level of personal development. Mm. And that's everything to me. It's mm-hmm. everything. It's how I run my life. And it's also why I want to help people transform their lives. Because when I help them transform personally, it raises the ceiling for which success is waiting for them. And then they grow and they, they bump against that ceiling of success. So then you, you personally grow and then that ceiling rises and then your success comes up to meet it again. That's actually the journey of entrepreneurship. And that is what, entre- what makes entrepreneurship different is that it really is a blend of business and self-help, personal development, which is why I wrote Lingo as I did. It is 80% business strategy, 20% or so, maybe 70-30 split, but it's a good percentage of it is self-help. And I sort of address that in the book. Now that I gave you the strategies you need, now let me give you the inside work that will support the strategies you've been given so that you you develop personally so that the strategies of Lingo as you apply them you will actually see the results. And that is why I loved it so much. (laughs) Um, What what you just mentioned, I notice, and you can tell me if this feels true for you, whenever I'm expanding to a next level, it's almost like energetically or my body or like my shell has to break or something. There's like a, a discomfort that's almost physical when I'm, you know, making a big growth leap. Do you relate to that? Do you know what I'm talking about? Absolutely. So yeah, I've been doing a lot of work around the idea of quantum leaps because I try to, at the end of the day, I try to make things attainable and usable. And quantum leaps have always been so ethereal. I've I've been looking at how can I help people create the environment for which a quantum leap can happen. And I think we have to. I don't think a quantum leap Again, it's that balance of effort and surrender. You can't just surrender to when the universe, the, those forces working on our behalf, we can't just surrender to when those forces decide to work on your behalf and create a quantum leap. You have to, you have to put in the effort. When my kids were little, a phrase I would say to them all the time is you have to meet the sun halfway. Mm. Right? That was a phrase I used when they were little kids. Like, Because my kids were growing up blessed. They were fortunate. And I didn't want spoiled kids. So I also wanted, and thankfully, all three of my kids are really hard workers. And I think it's innately because, hey, they could have been spoiled brats, but I didn't want that. And I didn't want that for them. And I used to it's like, you know, but I also wanted them to have a positive attitude. We I wanted them to count their blessings and be grateful. So I wanted them, you know, I would say to them, hey, you know, the sun is shining on your life. We, we live in this really nice town in Connecticut and the sun is shining in your life, but you have to meet the sun halfway. So... That's why I feel like with quantum leaps, it's you have to create the environment for which the forces could then work on your behalf to create for you that massive leap across whatever cavern you stand in front of to get you to where you want to go. So I have been systematically breaking down what it takes to create that leap. And and I will tell you, Lucy, there are a lot of steps to it and how I prepare people. I prepare people so that they can set the environment for that quantum leap to happen. The turning point is getting really clear on what you need to let go of. You simply cannot leap. I mean, to the point that I actually get a little more forceful with it and say, what is it that you hate that you want to get away from? Because it is the force of what you never want to see in your life. You never want to see poverty again. You never want to struggle to pay your bills. You never want to be in an abusive relationship again. It's getting really clear on what you absolutely never, ever want in your life again. You get clear on that. 
that is the energy of force that the universe needs to hear from you to say, you're ready. And now I will help you leap across that cavern so that you can have the quantum leap that you want in your life. And in my description for imaging, by the way, this will be a big part of my talk at imaging about life is an everything bagel. And in the description I wrote for imaging to publish on their website about my talk, I said, look, 2020 is a leap year. Let's make it more than just a year on a calendar, but let's make it the year you have the quantum leap in your life that you want. Wow. I love it. That's huge. Yes. What I want to do in that talk is I'm going to help people. I've, I've broken it up into a system. Mm-hmm. I'm going to demonstrate the system to set up your life so that you can then trust in forces that you can't even imagine that will do the rest of the work for you. But you have to meet the sun halfway. You have to set up the environment for that quantum leap to happen and then trust in the forces working on your behalf. Yes. Well, I'll be in the front row. Awesome. I'll look for you. <laughs> So, oh my gosh, Jeffrey, I, I would love to go on for another hour with you. I just so love this conversation. So people want to contact you. How do they get in touch with you? So my main website is jeffreyshaw.com. From there, there's the podcast, there's all the things I do, all the squirrels I chase, they're all there. So you can branch off jeffreyshaw.com to whatever you think will serve you, including my coaching services, my brand consulting, the podcast, my speeches, everything's there from jeffreyshaw.com. Great. And you had a little offer for us. What was that and where can we find it? Yeah. So you would go to lingoreview.com. And what I love to help people do, again, my, my role is to find what is brandable and marketable in people, right? So I start with really figuring out what is brandable about you, what makes you unique, and then how do we communicate that by speaking the right lingo to the people that you are meant to serve that already value what you have to offer. So I offer as a gift to your listeners this opportunity for me to review their websites. They go to lingoreview.com. They fill out an application, which actually are some inner questions. I want to know about their values and what they think their clients value. I then go to your website to see if you are communicating what you intend on saying to connect with your ideal customers. And I can tell you, 98% of people do not. I so agree. then I will, <laughs> there's just a huge communication break between what we, what we feel on the inside and the way we're putting it out in the world. And that's then what I do, I help people find what's brandable in them. And then how do you put it out in the world to help you attract the people that already value what you do? So you're no longer chasing down people. And so I'll, I'll return an email with, with a few tips on how you can improve what you're communicating on your website. So it's lingoreview.com. Thank you for that offer. I know people are going to really, really love getting your input on that. Jeffrey, this has been so great. And honestly, I would love to interview you once a week. I I think there's so much more that we can talk about. So just really grateful. And I love your show and, you know, I love your book. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me on. And I look forward to seeing you at Imaging USA in January. Yes. All righty. I wanted to conclude this with a little bit of a summary of three main messages or parts of our conversation. So if you, dear listener, would like a little mini version of our conversation, here are three areas that I found especially helpful and fun and rich about the conversation. So one, we talked about his book, Lingo, and how he transitioned from basically a starving artist working too hard for too little money to a highly profitable and sought after photographer. And when he discovered the lingo of his ideal client, how that led to him being highly successful. And the main thing I really loved is that he said he found wealthy people, you know, realized that's, that was his calling, but people who were family centric who had the income to create really great lives so that they could focus on their children. And we talked a little about the myth that wealthy people don't spend money. And he mentioned, first of all, that making judgments about anything is something not to be recommended, but especially wealthy people who are family-centric and who love photography, they will invest whatever they need to 
to have the experience of walking down the hall and standing in front of a portrait and feeling a beautiful moment in their family's life again. I liked that, that he realized that's the need that his clients and my clients have that they don't know. And in his program that he did at the Photographers of America and other programs he's given, his most tweetable slide is the one that says, it's not your job to prove your value to anyone. It's your job to find people who already value what you do. I really love that thought. We also talked about why he's big on the squirrels, why the word squirrel is important in his teaching, and why he has hundreds of squirrels, possibly. I've seen a picture of some shelves because people send them squirrels. Now, what he said is, that chasing squirrels to him is not about allowing ourselves to be distracted to our detriment, but allowing ourselves to notice what we notice, feel what we feel, act on impulses. The world needs creative solutions. And people like us that are not traditionally minded, we often suffer in our culture because our culture is trying to make us sit still and pick a path. And He suggests that we don't shut down that part of us that sees more and hears more and feels more. In business, if we can allow, I would say, our ponies to run a bit, we'll have a healthier business model. And he also suggests multiple streams of income. His thought is that we all have something core within us. And whatever we do, whatever form it takes, there's going to be something that connects. For him, he loves transformation. So he loves transformation in the dark room. He loves transformation in photography, in his coaching, in his books, his teaching, everything he does. The third area that I found really rich was talking about the entrepreneur's ecosystem. And what he means by that is that we will not really thrive when we have just business strategies. We need the right mindset. We need practices. We need to put ourselves out on a limb as creative warriors. But also, and I love this, he said, our fragile souls, our intuitive, empathic selves need to know strongly how we can serve other people. That is something core to what he calls the creative warrior. So we need a community. We need a mindset change. We need practices. We need better branding. We need many inner shifts as well as outer shifts. He talked about how chasing different gurus to try to find the answers is going to get us confused. And what we need to do is to drop into our inner knowing and finding what's best for us. He also talks about how the line between our business and our personal life is almost non-existent. And I love that part. He quoted Jim Rowan, his favorite quote, your level of success rarely exceeds your level of personal development. So thinking about how blending our business and personal growth and how all of it goes together to spiral up, up, up is just a fantastic and challenging part of being an entrepreneur. So again, I want to remind you all that I have a group coming up in September and I would love for you to go to lucydumascoaching.com. You can see a link called Classes and either join or click and get on my calendar to have a quick chat to learn more. If you don't already have my ebook, 10 Big Ideas for Marketing in the Real World, you can also get it there. You have been listening to The Highly Profitable Photographer with Lucy Dumas. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe, review, and share. To connect one-on-one and learn more about our coaching programs, just go to lucydumascoaching.com. Until next time, go have fun photographing and selling your work.